I have no idea how an academic follows an act like that. Um, except to say that uh, Gideon was learning a lesson in discipleship, and our topic today is discipleship, and it uh, looks like we're ready to go. Uh, we're going to be looking together at Matthew chapter 11, verses uh, 25 to 30, and if you have your copies of the scripture, I'm going to ask you to open there. <clears throat> the title says Wisdom from the First Century Manuscript, and those of you who are in the Bible department may recognize that this is not a first century manuscript. This is actually a third century manuscript, but it does contain the Gospels, and it is very similar, undoubtedly, to the earliest copies of the Gospel of Matthew. I want us to stand together, if you will, with me and read the scripture. You may either read from the copy you have in front of you, or you may read from the PowerPoint slide that we have uh, projected here. I would like us to read this together aloud. If we can read it a little bit more slowly than we normally read, uh, pay attention to the punctuation, and let's try to stay together as we read the scriptures. Matthew 11, verses 25 to 30, begin together with me. At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent, and hast revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. All things are delivered unto me of my Father, and no man knoweth the Son but the Father. Neither knoweth any man the Father save the Son and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Let's pray together. Our Father, we ask for your special help as we reflect upon your word this morning. We thank you for the Lord Jesus and for the call that he has placed upon our lives. We pray that you would help us to hear and understand your word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> I'd like to divide my presentation up into uh, two parts. The first part is kind of introductory and has a little bit to do with methodology. That is, transmitting the message of the Lord Jesus from the first century to our day. And then in the second part, which will take up the bulk of our time, we're going to look at the content of this particular passage of Scripture. Now, the reason I want to focus on the transmitting of the message from the first century is precisely because of this whole issue of the medium in which God's Word is presented whether we are talking about a drama or whether we're talking about a musical presentation of truth or whether we're talking about the exposition of God's Word, I would like to uh, remind us that the Bible's content and meaning has been and can be transmitted through different media, through different means. Now, <clears throat> when the Scriptures were first given, the earliest medium of scripture were handwritten copies and actually believers did not have these copies they heard the word orally recited or preached by the Lord Jesus and by the apostles before it was inscripturated primarily the hearing of God's word came in public forums when someone who had a copy of scripture was reading it orally and so we have these handwritten manuscripts that really were in the form of scrolls in the earliest days, and this was, of course, before the time of the printing press. Early in the church, a change began to take place when these scrolls now began to be transmitted in the form of the codex or in the form of a book. That was quite a change for people, and some religious people felt like this couldn't really be God's word if it wasn't a scroll, if it was a book, and there was quite an adjustment that needed to take place. Another change took place when the printing press was invented, and we all know about Gutenberg's printing press. 
suddenly, <clears throat> rather than just listening to the Word of God being recited by someone, people now have the privilege of holding copies of Scripture in their own hands. More people are able to have their own copy of the Scripture. And we had the development of the typeset book. So people had two things to adjust to. First, it was no longer a scroll. And not only that, now it was no longer handwritten. And some people felt like if it wasn't handwritten, that somehow it wasn't really God's Word. But it was. We come to our day, and we have this proliferation of media by which texts can be transmitted. Orally again by radio and TV, and how many of us have listened to the scriptures over the radio or heard them on the television when we were in another room? Then through the medium of record players and cassette tapes and CDs. And visually on web pages and streaming audio, and you can even get copies of scripture now on electronic books. And it is still God's Word. When we project a PowerPoint slide of Scripture or the outline of a message, it is still the preaching and proclaiming of truth of God's Word. Now, I'm talking about this because it's something that I think a lot about. As I try to figure out how do I communicate Scripture to an audience today that is so visually oriented, and I remind myself that when we integrate various media in the presentation of God's Word, we are still proclaiming God's Word. God's Word is no less His Word when it is heard, or when it is recited, or when it is rehearsed from memory, when it's read silently from a book, or through some other medium. And we don't know what the future holds yet. There may be yet other technological developments by which we receive God's Word and can transmit it to others. I would like to suggest that we think clearly about the fact that God's Word is no less His Word when it is heard live or recited by memory or read silently in a book or seen and read through some other medium. The second thing about transmitting God's Word that I would like us to focus on for a moment, lest I be understood, misunderstood, is that the Bible has been given by divine inspiration specifically as a verbal or linguistic deposit of truth. That is, in all these mediums, we cannot escape the fact that God's message as a message consists of words and sentences and paragraphs. It consists of text. It will therefore always have a divinely intended textual meaning, whether we hear it or read it, see it enacted out in front of us, or visualize it in some other way. It is this linguistic original, this text, that was given by God's divine inspiration. Its textual meaning properly interpreted then is what we are after. It must be the final authority of our understanding of God's Word. Now, if I've not lost you completely, let's make a third point about the text. You see, I'm trying to get you to think about the text. The Bible as text stands as a completed work, which we know as the canon of Scripture or the 66 books of divine revelation. Whenever we are reading it or studying it or receiving it through some medium or hearing it in music, we must always interpret that piece, that fragment, that portion, in light of the whole of God's Word, God's completed revelation. This is what gives us the unique, precious gift of holding in our hands and in our laps the completed canon of Scripture. We don't lug about with the 66 scrolls. Uh, we don't have these huge uh, bundles of papyri to carry around or leather parchments. We have, and some of you have very tiny ones, we hold the complete canon of Scripture in our hands. And this is a wonderful gift. So, what makes preaching and teaching and music or sound bites or a skit potentially misleading is when we take that portion out 
of the context of the whole of Scripture and interpret it apart from the rest of God's revelation. That's what makes Scripture as the canon, the completed work, so terribly important. We need a balanced understanding of God's Word as God intended to give it to us. And so that's why I encourage you, in the use of the media, to also keep your Bibles open on your laps, as most of you do, to remind ourselves that we have all of God's Word in our possession. Now, having said those things, may the Lord give us understanding about what I'm trying to communicate. Let's move on then to the text. Interpreting this first century message for our day. Now, I'd like to take us through five steps, um, quickly, but hopefully not too quickly. We want to look at, and these are illustrative of the exposition of God's Word. We only do them uh, briefly here. They need to be done in greater depth as we study God's Word on our own. We want to look at the context of this fragment of Scripture. We want to look at the text itself. Then we want to look at its canonical background, particularly Scriptures before Matthew that may have contained the same themes and the same ideas. We want to look at what has sometimes been called the analogy of faith. That is, out of Scripture comes our body of truth. We sometimes call it our systematic theology. The, the sum total of truth that we know and understand and that we're committed to. And when we study a portion of Scripture, it's always good to glance at that larger body of truth and relate our text to some of those great truths. And then finally, as we come down to ten minutes to our next class, We'll make some personal applications and we'll ask God's Spirit to help us as we look at this text to, to aim for the target, which is how does this first century text apply to me? How does it apply to you? Now let's start with the context. You have all heard it said that a text without a context is a pretext. It may well be a pretext. Now there are some exceptions to that. A proverb can stand by itself. But even there, we need it set in the context of all of God's self-revelation. We want to look at this passage in Matthew that we have read together. And we want to do it in a way that we respect just how the Holy Spirit has chosen through Matthew to shape the text. In other words, we don't want to give it our own shape. We want to allow God to communicate to us by the way he has shaped the text. Let me illustrate this with a fragment from a piece of art. Some of you may recognize this, some of you who are um, strong in the humanities, but here I've taken a little section out of a work of art and I've torn it out of its context. Now, as we look at this, we might not be sure, is, you know, is this the three musketeers trying to persuade somebody of something? Uh, who is this? And is there, a, is there a fifth guy squeezed in there? Um, what is this? It's very difficult to know unless you have seen this in its context. So let me give you its context. It's actually from Rembrandt's painting on the stoning of Stephen. And the little fellow up here in the corner is the Apostle Paul, who's holding the coat while Stephen is being stoned. Now suddenly we understand that little scene in its broader context. And we see Stephen being stoned. Now, those of you who are interested in art may know that this is the first painting in which Rembrandt placed himself. And I haven't quite figured out which face is Rembrandt because four or five of them look exactly the same to me. But once you see the bigger picture, we start interpreting it by the way the, the artist intended us to understand even that little fragment concerning the Apostle Paul. So we come back to our text. And we notice as our text begins in Matthew 11:25, it says, At that time, Jesus answered. Or at that time, Jesus responded to the situation. He's not actually answering a question. He's responding to the situation of the immediate context. And so we look at the context. And if you look back at the beginning of chapter 11, we find in verse 1 that Jesus had gone to preach in the cities. We find out in verses 2 through 19 that the people had rejected both John the Baptist's ministry and the ministry of the Lord Jesus. So the context is one of rejecting the Word of God. When we get to verses 20 to 24, we find that even the cities of Israel had rejected the Lord Jesus, especially the cities where he had done most of his miracles. And the context tells us that these cities would experience a more severe judgment than would Tyre and Sidon and even Sodom. 
Now, it's in that context, the context of the rejection of the Lord Jesus Christ, that our message is placed. And so we ask ourselves, are we in the context of a people who reject the Lord Jesus? We might draw from this three important points as we come to our text. Number one, Jesus judges people according to the opportunities they have had to respond to his truth. The greater miracles come with greater judgment. But we have opportunity to receive the truth. God often judges corporately for corporate sin, whether it's this generation, as he said to the Jewish people, or these particular cities who as a whole have been unresponsive to the gospel. Are we as a nation unresponsive to the gospel? Are we as a college unresponsive to the gospel? Do we stand in danger of this kind of judgment? Number three, gets even closer to home. Those who claim to be God's people are often the most hard-hearted of all. Now let's look at our text. The text itself. When we look at a, a text of scripture like this, one of the most important things is to begin to make observations about it. Observation, interpretation, observation, interpretation, application. O-I, O-I-A. That's the way we study scripture. We look at it, we try to observe the details, we try to see things that we've never seen before. Now, one of the first things we can do when we observe a text like this, which is a, a block of writing, which when it was first given actually didn't have spaces between words, let alone between paragraphs, is to divide it into particular sections. And so we can take this text and read it carefully, and when we do so, we find out it can be broken into three components. Three subdivisions. First of all, the Lord Jesus prays. Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, Father, and he prays. Verses 25 to 26. When we come to verse 27, he's no longer praying, but he's making a claim. All things are delivered unto me. After making this claim, then the Lord Jesus gives a call. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. And so our observation tells us we have three, three little acts in the drama, if you will, three paragraphs, subdivisions within this larger pericope or section of Scripture. Now let's look at these one by one and observe them a little more carefully. Let's keep the text before us. And here it is. The Lord Jesus is praying to the Father. And quickly we want to notice three, three or four specific things that come out of this text. Jesus responds to his own rejection by recognizing his Father's sovereign purpose. I think that's very refreshing. How do we respond when we're rejected, when we try to give the gospel? Jesus responded by saying, I thank thee, Father. So Jesus understood that his Father was sovereign, even in the experience, the negative experiences of his own life. The second thing we learn from Jesus' prayer is that Jesus, is that God rejects the proud, those who are wise in their own understanding, the wise and the prudent. And God favors the humble or the childlike. Now, we'll come back to that. The third thing that we grasp from this particular section is from the last part, Father, so it seemed good in thy sight. Jesus understood that the Father does his will. The Father does what is his good pleasure. He does what is good in his sight. And so this prayer is one steeped in a recognition of the sovereignty of God. Now Jesus' claim. Let's make some observations about this. The first thing we notice is that the Father has entrusted everything to the Son. All things are delivered unto me of my Father. Secondly, that only, because of this, only the Son who is known of the Father can truly know the Father. No man knoweth the Son, but the Father neither knoweth any man the Father except the Son. Jesus is making an unusual claim here. He's saying, I am the only one who really knows God the Father. And then he makes the third point. And he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. Notice what the text is saying here. It is the Lord Jesus himself who determines to whom he will reveal God the Father. 
Now, let's let that sink down into our computers. <laughs> it is only the Son, it is only the Lord Jesus who determines to whom He will reveal the Father. These are not my words, these are the words of the Lord Jesus. That's his claim. That's an awesome claim. He's really saying, I am the ultimate revealer of God. Well, we've seen that claim elsewhere in Scripture, haven't we? Hebrews, John chapter 1, verse 18, No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, He has revealed Him. Hebrews 1, 3, The Son is the brightness of His glory and the express image of His person. Colossians 2, 9, in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Or we think of passages like when Jesus says, He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father except by me. And in light of this, Jesus then gives us an invitation. It's an invitation to discipleship. Jesus invites us to do three things. Notice the underlying portions. Number one, come to him. Jesus says, come to me. Respond in faith to me. Secondly, he says, take my yoke upon you. That is, become his disciple. Become his disciple. Take my yoke upon you. Now, Dr. Kessler and I have been talking about metaphors. Here's a metaphor. Jesus is saying, take my yoke upon you. Yokes in biblical times might have referred to yokes on draft animals who pulled carts and plows, or it may have referred to yokes on prisoners. These were not comfortable things. They were heavy, made out of iron and heavy wood. They were rough. But the metaphor is used to speak of toil and submission and discipline and duty and obedience, i.e., discipleship. We could say that this could be, in a dynamic equivalent, be translated as, become my disciple. Become my disciple. Some tribal translations have rendered it that way because the people had no concept of a yoke. And so the metaphor was dropped and the intended meaning was translated. There was an early church tradition that the Lord Jesus, over his carpentry shop, and I, I, I recognize that this is historical fantasy, had a sign that said, My yoke fits well. Remember, Jesus was a carpenter. He may well have made some yokes. Come to him, be his disciple, learn from him, or grow in discipleship. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. The Greek verb for learn is a cognate of the Greek noun for discipleship. Discipleship involves learning how to follow one such as the Savior. Now, not only does the Lord give us three invitations, but He gives us three assurances. Number one, when we come to Him in this way, we will find Him gentle and humble, meek and lowly in heart. We will find His yoke to be easy and light, and we will receive and find rest. That's the text. Now, I must hurry on. Very quickly, I want to give you some background. We're going to try to do this rather quickly, so fasten your seatbelts. It is important. Scripture echoes Scripture. That is, things that were written before are echoed by things that are said and written later within the canonical Scripture. And sometimes, writings that are not in Scripture uh, have an influence on Scripture. And in this case, a book called Sirach, or Ecclesiasticus, which is not part of Scripture, actually may have impacted the words of the Lord Jesus. Let me try to explain this. Sirach, Ecclesiasticus, is part of the Apocrypha. You say, oh, that's right, you should. It's not Scripture. But we do recognize that in 1611, when the first editions of the King James came out, it was placed between the Old and New Testaments with the rest of the Apocrypha, not as Scripture but for historical background. And the translators of the King James Bible were not foolish. They understood why they were placing it there. I think it was wiser later to drop it out, but unfortunately we have lost some of this literary background. This text was influential in the time of Christ, particularly on this point. It celebrated the law, the keeping of the law, under the guise of wisdom. Under the guise of wisdom. 
And so we find certain parallels in Sirach 51, for example. The chapter begins by saying, I give you thanks, O Lord, exactly how Jesus began. Wisdom says, draw near to me. Jesus said, come unto me. Verse 26 says, put your neck under her yoke and let your souls receive learning. The yoke here is the wisdom of Torah, the wisdom of the law. The writer says, I have labored but little and find for myself much rest. Now, who could deny that this might be a literary background to what the Lord Jesus is saying? What's the point? Jesus is called wisdom only once in Scripture, but very emphatically by the Apostle Paul. 1 Corinthians 1, 22 to 30. Notice these portions. The Jews require a sign. The Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, the gospel, Christ, the power of God, and the what? Wisdom of God. Where is true wisdom? It's not in the law and the keeping of the law. It's in the Lord Jesus Christ. And of Him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom. I think Jesus may be correcting a contemporary Jewish misunderstanding, and it's a misunderstanding of our day as well, that salvation comes from keeping the stipulations of Torah or the stipulations of the law, or the rules and regulations, excuse me, of the Christian life. That somehow by doing these things, we somehow gain wisdom. Almost right, but fatally wrong. Jesus is saying, you will only find rest and salvation and the path of true discipleship when you come to me and take my yoke upon you. I am wisdom. Now let's leave the non-canonical text and come to two canonical scriptures. Jeremiah 6, 16-17. Thus saith the Lord, stand ye in the ways and see, this is on the eve of the exile, ask for the old paths, where is the good way, and walk therein. That is, the way of God's word, the way of God's revelation. And Jeremiah says, and ye shall find what? Rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk therein. I trust that that is not our heart. Also, I said, watch over you, saying, hearken to the sound of the trumpet, but we will not hearken. One last text, Jeremiah 28, 12. Watch this carefully. Jesus may well have had this in mind. Almost 40% of everything Jesus said was either a quote or an allusion to the Old Testament. It's amazing. Isaiah 28, Woe to the drunkards of Ephraim! cities of God's people. Whom shall he teach knowledge and whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Not the proud and the wise, but who? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breasts. To whom is God revealed according to Jesus? To the babes. This is the rest wherewith he may cause the weary to rest. Come unto me all ye that are weary and heavy laden. And this is the refreshing and they would not hear. Let I hear the word of the Lord, you scornful men. Was Isaiah thinking about the Messiah? You go down to verse 16. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, in Zion I lay for a foundation a stone, the Lord Jesus Christ, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. The canonical background. It makes sense, doesn't it? The analogy of faith. <clears throat> Let me draw a line to three important truths. We come to the application. Verses 25 to 27. God is absolutely sovereign. When it comes to those who respond to the gospel and those who reject the gospel, God is absolutely sovereign. He has hid things from the wise and the prudent. He has revealed them to the babes. The Lord Jesus determines to whom he will reveal the Father. God is sovereign. And all the Calvinists say, Amen. We come to the second point. Come unto me all. All ye who are weary and heavy laden. And all the Armenians say, Amen. The gospel is freely offered to all. 
Now you can work that out. <laughs> so that's the most important theological truth. And we cannot escape it. Salvation, and that's a whole theme we could trace through Scripture. Salvation, rest, true rest, the rest that you and I hunger for, comes by faith in the Lord Jesus and a faith that leads to discipleship. Now we must come to the hardest part of all of Scripture, all of the preaching of Scripture, which is the application of Scripture to our hearts, which only the Holy Spirit can do. And so failed preachers, sinful preachers saved by grace, can only stand up with stammering lips and say, look at the text, let us respond to it. Personal application. Let's look at the first part of the text. Let's come back to the text. Look at it with your eyes. Read it again silently. And ask yourself this question, as I ask myself. Am I like the cities where so many of Jesus' works were done, and yet I have not repented? or responded properly. Help me to repent, as it were, in sackcloth and ashes, and thereby escape such awful judgment, worse than that of Sodom. Father, may I be as a child in your eyes, and not proud and self-sufficient. Some of us, I am afraid, are calloused and hard and proud, May I be like a child, and in that condition, in that condition, may it please God to reveal himself in us. So I would suggest the first response to our text, to the living word of God, is this. Lord, give me a humble and repentant attitude that prepares me for your revelation. Is that the response of your heart? I trust that it is. This is for all of us, isn't it? It doesn't matter how long we've walked with the Lord, how long we've been as disciples, how high up in the ranks of the church we have gone, or how lowly we are. Our response ought to be that of the penitent thief on the cross. We come to Jesus, broken, and open to his self-revelation. Paragraph 2, verse 27. Read the text. Look at what the Lord Jesus says. What is this awesome claim that he makes? Do you see that true knowledge of God is centered in the Lord Jesus Christ, God's Son? But the Father points to the Son, and the, the Son perfectly reveals the Father. That he is the way, the truth, and the life for you and for me. Do you recognize that you can only know God, you can only know the Father, if the Son chooses to reveal Him to you? Is it the cry of your heart that you need Jesus to reveal God to you by His Spirit? Open our eyes, Lord. I want to see Jesus through your Word and by your Spirit. Can we respond this way in the heart of our hearts, in the quietness, of our souls. Lord God, help me to see Jesus as the only one who can truly teach me to know you. And we come to the last wonderful invitation of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we read the text again and we look at its words and we ask the Spirit of God to speak to our hearts so prone to hardness and pride do we realize that the yoke of the law as a system of works, as a human attempt to keep rules and regulations, as a way to please God and find rest, is a burden that is heavy and harsh? You know, some of us put on a pretty good act. <laughs> you know, we, we've got it down pretty good. We know what to do so that the outward appearance is acceptable. 
And inside our hearts, we long for God Himself. And we find all of these standards that are necessary in society and in the church and in the school, when it comes to seeking God, we find them only oppressive and they do not satisfy. Don't think they can. That is not what they are designed to do. Jesus does not ask me to be perfect. He only asks me to trust Him, to learn from Him, to be His disciple. He is the true meaning of the law and of the regulations and of the stipulations and of the standards. He fulfills the law for me that I might be righteous in God's eyes. Furthermore, He teaches me the true meaning of the law when I follow Him. So as Paul says, the righteous requirements of the law are fulfilled in us who walk by the Spirit and not after the external stipulations of the law. May I flee to Jesus and trust in Him and learn to follow Him. This is true wisdom from the first century. This is true discipleship. Can you respond this way? Can I? May God help us to do this. Gentle, meek and lowly. Gentle, Lord Jesus, I come to you. I take your yoke, your discipleship upon me. I want to be your disciple. I want to learn from you. I know you will give me true, satisfying, and perfect rest. Jesus said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Let's pray together. Well, Father, your word is truth. And it points us to the Lord Jesus Christ, the perfect answer to our souls. And we pray today as we go about our classes and our exams and our activities that we might reflect on the words of our Lord Jesus on his prayer, on his awesome claim, and on his invitation to us. And give us hearts, repentant, humble hearts, to follow hard after him, that we might then hear his great commission that says, Go ye into all the world and make disciples. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.